Today I'm going to show you how to use processors with Unity's new input system. I'll also go over each one of them as well as how to implement your own custom one. So to get started, I already have this scene set up. If you don't have the input system installed, go to Window Package Manager, then go to Unity Registry, scroll down to Input System over here, and then just click Install and restart the editor once it prompts you. And so I'm just going to open this input action asset I already have created. If you're not familiar with the input system, I recommend watching some other videos that I have on it. But basically you can create one by right clicking create input actions and define your action map and your actions. So just to give you an idea of what I have, you can move around, you can look around and you can jump. And so those actions are displayed here, move, jump and look. And so let's go and add a processor. So you can add a processor to either the action itself or the binding. If you add it to the binding, it will affect only the binding. If you add it to the action, it will affect all of the bindings. So I'm just going to open this up and select one of the bindings. And down here we can add a processor. So there's multiple processors that we can choose from. Processors depend on the type of the action. So for example, our move is a vector two. So we'll be able to add processors that affect vector twos. So what a processor does, it basically processes your input after it's received. So for example, let's go over one. If I click invert vector two, what this will do is when the input is received, and the interaction is added to it and everything. Once this sends out the input event that the script is listening to to move the player, it will first process the value. And so in this case, it will invert the vector two on both the X and the Y. So if we save this asset and we press play, you'll see that now when I move the joystick up, it moves backwards. And when I move it down, it moves forwards. Vice versa, when I move it to the left, it moves right. And when I move it to the right, it moves left. So basically it times the values by negative one on both the X and the Y, hence the invert. So let's remove that processor. Let's go over normalize. So what normalize does is it basically just returns the direction of a vector. Instead of having a vector with a variable distance, for example, a vector with a distance of 0.5, normalize just normalizes that value, makes it normal and puts it to a distance of one. So in that case, before when we moved the joystick a little, it moved slowly and when we moved it more, it moved faster. However, since the distance is always the same, even if I move the joystick a little bit, it'll go at full speed. And just as comparison, if I remove it, you'll see that once I move it slowly, the character moves slowly and speeds up when I go full force. And so normalizing is mostly used if you just want the direction and you don't really care about the value of the vector. All right, so now let's do scale. So scaling just multiplies that vector two by the value you set for the X and the Y. So for example, if I set this X value to 20, it'll scale the X input by 20. So it'll times it by 20. So now let's see if I move forwards, it runs normally. However, if I move sideways, you'll see that now it runs super fast and it's kind of glitched out with the camera here. And so if you want to scale your vector for any reason, you can just add this processor here pretty easily. And then for the last one for vector two, we have a stick dead zone. And so what this does is that it creates a dead zone on your joystick. So this is mostly used for joystick. So it would work on this virtual joystick or if you actually use a gamepad. So we have two variables here, minimum and maximum. So a joystick is a vector two and for each axis, it returns a value between negative one and one. If it's zero, that means the joystick is at the center. If it's negative one, it means it's on the negative side. And if it's positive, that means it's on the positive side. For example, on the X, if it's negative, that means it's on the left. And if it's positive, that means it's on the right. So the way this works is that we have this minimum value. And if the magnitude of our input is smaller than that minimum value, then the input won't be registered. So in order for the input to not be zero, it has to be greater than the minimum value. And if the magnitude of that input vector is greater than the maximum value, the length is normalized to one. And the magnitude here just means the length of the vector. So to compare a vector with a float, we need to take the length and that's the magnitude. And we compare it with this minimum and maximum value. And this is done to avoid the dead zone. And you can actually remove these default here and set it if you'd like manually. So I can set it to 0.5 as an example, or you can open up the input settings, create your own settings asset and adjust the default values here. So it will change the default for all of the other processors. In this case, it would be the default dead zone min. So why would you want a dead zone? Well, this helps with unintentional input. So sometimes in a gamepad, for example, the joystick isn't always completely centered on zero, zero, which is the center. It might be a little offset. And so that might cause the player to move if you're not intending it to move. So with the dead zone, you basically guarantee that this player will not move 
unless you are the one providing the input. Also, there's sometimes a problem where some controls don't consistently report their maximum values when you move a joystick all the way to the corner or the maximum value that it can go. So by setting a dead zone for the maximum, you can also avoid this problem. So let's try this out. So I'm going to put 0.5 for a minimum. So here, if I move the joystick a little, you see that it's not moving at all because I haven't passed the 0.5 threshold. However, if now I move it past 0.5, it starts moving slowly and then starts going as usual. All right, awesome. So that's the ones for vector two. All right, and now let's go over the float ones, which if I open the jump and I just click a binding here, under the processor, you'll see that it's mostly the same. Scale, normalize, invert. We have two different ones. Axis dead zone is the same as stick dead zone, except it only impacts the axis, or in this case, the float, which is one value. And this is the exact same concept, so you can change these values if you'd like. All right, and finally, for the float, we have this clamp. And clamp just clamps the values, so if anything is less than the minimum, then it'll automatically be set to the minimum. So for example, if we put 0.2 and we have a value of zero, then that value of zero will automatically be converted to 0.2. And if anything is more than 0.9, then that value will be 0.9. So this is used if you want to keep a value within a certain range, which you can also use this if you don't want your player moving around like crazy. All right, so I hope that helped you a bit. Now I just want to go over if you want to add these in code directly. So to add these in code, just make sure you have this Unity engine.input system namespace imported. And you can actually create input actions through code if you don't want to have an input action asset for some reason or want to do something dynamically. So you can do new input action. And then if you'd like to add a processor, you can add it here directly. So for the processor's parameter, we have to put in a string and the string format is the name of the processor in camel case parentheses with its parameters equal to the value that you want to set it to. This is if you want to set a processor on an input action. If you want to set something on a binding, then you have to make a new input action and then you have to take that input action variable and do dot add binding along with the binding that you would want to add. And this is the string format that you want to add it with. This is the device gamepad and this is the actual binding left stick. And then you can do with processor and the same format as previously. And then you can do something with the action such as read the value. And then here I'm adding my own custom processor that I'll show you how to do in a moment. Another thing I want to mention is that the order of the processors is important. So this impacts how the system processes the values and you can change the priority with these arrows here. So for example, if we add the same processor two times, and let's say we want to invert it here, but let's say we don't want to invert it on the second one. And this is just to see how the priority impacts the actual value. So here, if we go up, it goes backwards. If we go to the side, it's also inverted. So the ones at the top have higher priority than the other ones at the bottom. And since you can have processors on the action themselves, this is also subject to a priority. So usually, a processor has more priority on the binding itself, and then a processor on the action has less priority. As an example, we can delete this processor, put the same one on the action, invert, and remove the invert. And when we play the game, you'll see that it's still inverted when we move. A little side note is that you can add processors on the controls themselves, and this link will be in the description if you're interested. So the control is the actual control. So for example, on your keyboard, the control would be the keys themselves. And if you're interested on what the difference is between a control and a binding, it's that an input binding basically looks up the different input controls that's available and selects one and attaches it to the action. So for example, there's the pointer press binding, but this press can mean multiple things. The press can mean a touchscreen, tablet, or mouse, and the binding basically puts that into one and will select the one at runtime that's being used. But you'll see that these are three different controls, but this is one binding. So if you want, you can actually put processors on the controls, which they actually do for some of them. For example, the gamepad one, they automatically add in a stick dead zone processor. And so this is kind of out of scope for this video, but if you're interested, the link is in the description. And basically you inherit from this interface and you implement your own input control and you specify what processors you want on it. All right, so to show you how to make your own processor in code. So this is literally straight from the documentation that I just copied. So first make sure you're using this unity engine.input system along with this using unity editor. And so for this, instead of deriving from mono behavior, we wanna derive from an input processor class. And here you have to specify what you want your value to be. So in this case, my value will be a float. If you want a vector two, 
and you just have to put vector 2 there. And so you have to make sure to derive from this and then you have to override this process function. So this actually processes the value. In this case, this shifts the value, my value shift processor. So we do public override flow process. We take in the value before it's processed along with this other variable that we need to take in because we're overriding. And it seems most processors don't actually use this, but it seems you can get access to the control that's currently driving the action. And so all we do here is do value plus how much we want to shift it by, which is a public float. And we can just do 10 and it'll shift it by 10. And so some other things I want to mention is that you have to add this if you want it to be available in your editor. So this gets added to the input action asset. And you can also add this through code like this, new input action processors, and then your processor here, which this should actually be camel case. So here we're doing, if we're in the editor, then initialize on load, which you need this namespace using Unity Editor for. Then this is a static constructor of this class. So if we're in the editor, then we need to initialize it. And it's static because we're going to initialize a static value. Here, input system.register processor. We have to make sure to register the processor. And then this is a static instance of our current class, my value shift processor. And this is just saying that this is loaded before the scene loads. So this also runs before the scene is loaded, when the game is played. And now when you go to your input action asset, for example, under processors, you have this my value shift which you can only add this on values that are floats. So for example, our stick, we won't be able to add this because it doesn't appear. One thing you'll notice is that we have this nice slider here. So you might be wondering how we put the slider there. And I also took this from the documentation. <laughs> but basically what you do is you make another script, make sure you're using Unity Editor and using Unity Engine editor. So if we're using the editor, if Unity Editor, then we have to make a class derived from input parameter editor and then you just put in the name of your processor and the script will automatically find the processor with that name and basically connect itself to it. So you don't need a direct reference to your processor class. So as you saw, we have a slider. So we have a label shift by just a GUI content, content on the GUI. We have an on enable function that we can use here. We have to override it. So you can put any initialization code you want here. And then on GUI, this is actually what gets drawn to the screen. So target is the instance of our class, the my value shift processor. So we do target dot value shift, which if you remember is our public float here. And we can do editor GUI layout dot slider with our label. This is the current value. This is the minimum and this is the maximum. And one last thing I want to mention is that processors must be stateless. So you can't store a local state in a processor. Processors are just meant to process something and not keep track of any states. So I hope that helped you out and that you enjoyed the video and that you'll hopefully be using some processors in the future. So if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe, it really helps me out. And I'd also like to thank my patrons. Thank you so much for all of your support. They make these videos possible and also help me pay my rent. So with that, I'd like to thank my new patrons. In the enthusiastic tier, we have Gibson, Alain, Nico, Keops, Wong, Joseph, Steven Sandlin, and Max from Holy Island. Thank you so much for all of your support. I really appreciate it. If you're interested, the link is in my description. I have resource code, early access to videos, an exclusive Discord channel, and more. And if you haven't already, make sure to join our Discord channel where you can chat, post memes, or ask questions. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure to like and subscribe. Thank you once again for watching, and see you next time. <laughs>